Good morning, everybody. It's lovely to see you uh, fresh from the lavender fields of <coughs> Norfolk. Um, we come, we've had a week's holiday with Ian's mum and our friend Malcolm. It's lovely to see you all. <clears throat> Can we just, uh, as we come to worship, read these familiar words? Philippians 4, verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. It's not always easy to do that, is it? I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, Whatever is lovely and whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. And that's a good thing as we come to our morning worship. Let's think about some of those things as we open in prayer. Let's pray. Loving God, we're here this morning to worship you and we ask that you would encircle us in your love that you would enable us by your power and that you would enfold us in your peace. Merciful God, we ask that you'd meet with us through your word, that we may rejoice in your love and show it in our dealings with people. Sovereign God, we ask that you would enlarge our vision, that in our worship today we might grasp just who you are, Mighty God, open our hearts to your presence now so that we may recognize that you are with us always through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Our first hymn is a very traditional one. I think Ian said we sang it last week, but I obviously wasn't here, so it didn't make any difference. Um, oh, uh, lead, guide us, O thou great Jehovah, pilgrim through this barren land. Let's stand to sing. another verse there <laughs> obviously caught us all on the hop um, I read this uh, this week and it, it, it made me think there was a, a little boy 
asked his dad a question and he said, what size is God? I don't know how you start to answer that, but his father looked up at the sky and he spotted a plane. So he said to his son, what size is that plane? And the boy replied, well, it's quite small because I can hardly see it. So then his dad took him to the airport and as they approached a plane, sat on the runway, his dad said, how big's that plane? Wow, it's huge, said the little boy. Well, said his dad, God's size depends on how close or how far away you are to God. The closer you are to him, the greater and bigger he will be in your life. And I thought that was a very, uh, inter you know, how I like pictures, and I thought that was a, a good picture. I don't know how big God is for you today. Um, Timothy Dudley Smith wrote these words, and uh, let me read them to you. Christ be my leader by night as by day, save through the darkness, for he is the way. Gladly I follow my future his care. Darkness is daylight when Jesus is there. Christ be my teacher in age as in youth, drifting or doubting, for he is the truth. Grant me to trust him through sifting as sand. Doubt cannot daunt me, in Jesus I stand. Christ be my saviour, in calm as in strife. Death cannot hold me, for he is the life. Nor darkness, nor doubting, nor sin and its stain can touch my salvation, with Jesus I reign. And that's a pretty big God, isn't it? Um, this next uh, hymn I, I do love, but I know maybe people are put off because the first line is, teach me to dance, and you think, no. <laughs> but it's obeying God's will, his hope, his, uh, his, his trust, his, uh, his love in his spirit for us. So let's stand as we sing the Graham Kendrick hymn, Teach Me to Dance. <laughs>
And all that's saying really is we want to be closer to you, God. We want you to know you better, to serve you um, more fully. Our reading um, is from Deuteronomy chapter 31, quite near the end. And it's Moses really handing over to Joshua. Deuteronomy 31, and we'll read the first eight verses. Then Moses went out and spoke these words to all Israel. I am now 120 years old, and I am no longer able to lead you. The Lord has said to me, you shall not cross the Jordan. The Lord your God himself will cross over ahead of you. He will destroy these nations before you, and you will take possession of their land. Joshua also will cross over ahead of you, as the Lord said. And the Lord will do to them what he did to Sion and Og, the kings of the Amorites, whom he destroyed along with their land. The Lord will deliver them to you, and you must do to them all that I have commanded you. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them, for the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you or forsake you. Then Moses summoned Joshua and said to him in the presence of all Israel, Be strong and courageous, for you must go with this people into the land that the Lord swore to their ancestors to give them, and you must divide it among them as their inheritance. The Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. That's great encouragement when I was, uh, was reading that because I know that God is with me. We all know that. Sometimes we just forget. But our next hymn reminds us that God has been with us a very long time, over many, many years. Let's stand to sing, Lord, for the years.
We're going to now pray the words that effectively you've just been singing, um, if you were thinking about those words. So there'll be quiet time and space uh, in our prayers for each of us to fill in personal details that uh, God has laid on our hearts that we want to bring before him. So there will be spaces for you to do that. Let's pray together. We come today, Lord, to uh, offer our thanks to you, to thank you that <coughs> you keep your promises and you bless us afresh every day. <coughs> Lord, we thank you for the joy of life, the joy of love the joy of faith and the joy of knowing you in a personal way. We don't always understand you, Lord. We barely grasp the <coughs> truth or the extent of your love. But just please receive our praise as we offer it with our thanks humbly and reverently in our worship today. We pray for our world in its unstable state. We pray for leaders, rulers, politicians, diplomats and governments who all need your wisdom and discerning as they make their decisions. We remember the victims of war and unrest who bear the scars of conflict daily. Those who are injured, <coughs> both mentally and physically, they're distressed, Lord. We pray for those who now live as homeless refugees with their livelihood and security gone. We remember those who've lost loved ones and pray for the children who've lost parents. We ask that evil may be conquered and hatred ended and harmony and peace take over. We thank you for your amazing grace to love us with all our faults and weaknesses. And we ask your forgiveness for the times we get it wrong. Give us, Lord, a longing to serve you better and help us to grow in the likeness of Jesus. We want to taste more of your goodness in our lives and although we have no claim on any of your attributes, we celebrate your glorious truth that you love us just as we are. And now, Lord, we remember our family and friends who, for whatever reason, need you today. So, Lord, take us now as individual people, but belonging to your family, and show us what we can each do in our churches to share the love of Jesus. Equip us, Lord, with the gifts we need and the strength to use them for your honour and glory. In our prayers we ask, in Jesus' name. Amen. The village chapel often come into our um, church because we use their music all the time. 
Um, but I thought it might be nice for this next hymn um, to go into their church and to see them uh, as they worship. So it's a live recording of It Is Well With My Soul. Let's stand to sing. Mm.
So whatever's going on around us, I do hope that your soul and mine are well. So, we've uh, met with the children of Israel many times on their journey, but they remind us so much of us. They're disobedient, they don't listen, they try to fix things themselves, and then they wonder why God takes so long to get things back on track. It's just like you and me, isn't it? Okay, they had a bit of a point, I suppose, because their journey to Canaan had taken 40 years. It was tedious, it seemed never-ending. But a lot of it was their own making, because they'd been disobedient. Their going against God had cost them dearly. So here we find Israel a bit fed up, even annoyed. Perhaps at the end of their tether, their patience and short supply. And they were even thinking it might be better to go back to Egypt, to slavery. They were at such a down place. They were sort of thinking it was better off when we were in Egypt. Boy, were they feeling sorry for themselves. So we pick up this passage that we read. And it's kind of Moses' farewell speech to them. <laughs> but is it what they want to hear? I don't think Moses wanted to upset them anymore. He knew they were kind of in a bad place, but he, he wanted to encourage them. And he wanted also um, to encourage their new leader, Joshua, to lean on God and his promises. Verse 2 we read, I am now 120 years old and I'm no longer able to lead you. Thinking about retiring? Don't hang your Bibles up quite yet. Most of us have a bit of a way to go. Um, but you know, God had already told Moses that he wasn't going to get to the promised land. So he's leading these people, knowing he's not going to get the, you know, the, 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 the reward, if you like. Um, and he knows that, and he's known that for a long time. But God also wanted his people to trust him and to trust in the new leader. So if you like, it was a bit of a switchover, a bit of a, a transition uh, for them. But in verse 3, God lays out his promises very carefully. He says, the Lord your God himself will cross over ahead of you. He will destroy the nations before you and you will take possession of their land. Joshua will also cross ahead as the Lord said. So they the know the situation. The, the, they've got the picture. But even taking all of this into account, there's monumental changes ahead for them. And just like us, I don't think we all like change very much. I don't. Um, and whether it's in our personal lives or whether it's in our church life or whether it's in the, uh, the, the life of our nation, we, we've seen um, quite a, a change in our nation. We went on a, a walking tour of Kings Lynn uh, the other night and uh, the guy was telling us that the mayor of Kings Lynn in her year of reign has had a jubilee, a monarch die, in a coronation that's quite a full year and you know that's just all the change that's just happened we can't help change i used to work with a lovely man that used to say constant change is here to stay think about it and uh, we uh, we used to get on really well but yes things happen it, it, you know people get ill people lose their jobs money gets tight living the cost of living rises and all of that and if we're not careful, we can be just like the children of Israel in a turmoil, confused, angry, and, and you know, not really uh, listening to God at all. God's voice had always been the voice of Moses, but now it was going to be different. And different people do things in different ways. The words of verse 6 are often used uh, to encourage and to calm people down when they get a bit scared or anxious. And then they start to doubt. And it says there, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. That's reiterated in Matthew's gospel. 
Um, and, you know, God is determined for the children of Israel and us to walk in obedience to him and to have his peace. And yet sometimes we just don't get it. Sometimes we just don't understand all of that. In our heads, we know God goes before us. We know that God goes with us. He walks with us. We know that he won't leave us. We read his promise in his word. We know that he has everything under his control, and yet it's still not enough for these human minds to take in. Now, in Beacon Loft, we've been praying for over a year now about our situation of not having a pastor. And I ask myself these questions. Is this time of not having a pastor, is it time to drive the church into the ground? I don't think so. I don't think um, that's God's intention for us at all. Maybe drive us to our knees, but not into the ground. Is this a time where God uh, wants us to suffer? I don't think that either. I think God always wants the best for us, so that's not what he wants. Should this time be spent getting further away from God? Well, that's not going to do any of us any good at all. So what is this time for? And my idea, my thoughts, I believe this time is being used by God to remind us of his faithful dedication and his complete willingness to be involved in everything that we do. He's giving us time to know him and his heart, each of us, not just as a big group of people, but individually as his children. He's giving us time so that we can really develop our trust in his promises. I don't think verse 6 that we read about being courageous and not being afraid, I don't think it's just for uh, our situation here. I think it applies to us all in our everyday uh, life. We need to learn from the teacher himself. God's always up front with us, isn't he? He doesn't have any hidden agenda. He tells it like it is. He doesn't string us along. He tells us exactly how it is. But then he gives us space to think about it, to pray about it, and to make good, knowledgeable, formed decisions. And sometimes they take a long time to make. Forty years in the case of the um, children of Israel, hopefully not quite that long here. But we do need to know God's direction and his will for each of us. And we need to be of one mind. We need to be united in all of that. Time is one of the greatest gifts that we have. And yet so often we abuse it. I know I do. So really, I suppose, because I had a bit more time last week on holiday and I, I had time to think, this is kind of where I was coming from. And this perhaps is the time of year when people begin to uh, travel a little bit. Maybe those of us who are fortunate, uh, we can take uh, a journey. And there's journeys, aren't there, that we love to take, you know, um, to see family, uh, to go to a special occasion or to go to a holiday destination. There's journeys that we maybe have to make, and the idea is just really to get from A to B as quickly as possible and do what we've got to do and then get back. There's other journeys that we like to make because we like to appreciate all the lovely things along the way, and we don't have to dash there and back. We can take time to look and appreciate. But there's some journeys that we shrink away from because we know that there's no good ending to it and we are loath to start those journeys. All the biblical journeys that were ever made that I've read about and all those journeys since, maybe the route and the mode of transport has changed, but the travelling companion and the director hasn't because, as we know, God doesn't change. He continues to accompany us 
and he promises to be there with us. The children of Israel uh, had, as we've sung in one of our hymns, the cloudy pillar uh, guiding them during the day and the fiery pillar uh, guiding them at night. And it's the same with us. We maybe don't have those physical things, but we do have God's guidance. We know that he always goes ahead of us. And I'm glad about that. I'm not very good with direction. And uh, so I'm glad there's somebody that does know where they're going ahead of me. He uh, scouts out the route, if you like, and uh, checks the direction and gets us in the right path. He also travels beside us, up close and personal. And I think he's there to support us and protect us when the way ahead isn't very clear or the situation is, is, is difficult. And he's there to encourage us and even pick us up, as you know, from the lost sheep when we get tired and weary. He travels behind us too because he wants us to, to keep us together. He wants us to all be together, not to leave anybody behind. And he's always covering our back. As I say, we've recently been to Norfolk and uh, Ian is excellent. Anybody that's ever been on a trip with him, he's excellent at uh, finding where to go, how to get there, what time, all the rest of it. Even where to stand on the station platform so that your carriage stops right beside where you are. <laughs> he's very good at all of that. And a lot of that information he gets from his app on his phone. I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm just using the words. We get all the information that we need. Places, people, times, events. Never works so well for me, probably because I haven't got an app, but an, or any app. But we can all tune in to the only source that we need, and it doesn't involve a smartphone. Our God, we've been singing and will sing, goes before us, beside us. He covers our backs from behind. Verse 8 says there, the Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Kind of the same as verse 6 there. It's a great positive way to take us into whatever the future holds for us as a church, as a nation, as an individual person. On this holiday, we regularly, in our, on our way into uh, Kings Lynn, we regularly drove past um, an arena called the Adrian Flux Arena. And uh, of course, when we first passed it, I've said, oh, I wonder who Adrian Flux is. I wonder if he's, he's, he's a sporting star that I haven't heard of, or, you know, he's, he's, he's a famous person and he's done some great things. Well, it turns out he was neither. He was just a man with a lot of money that obviously poured it into the arena. But every time we drove past, somebody in the car made some comment about Adrian Flux. And to be in a state of flux is where it's constantly changing, where perhaps we're not quite sure which way we're going or whatever. And that's, as I've said earlier on, is happening in our world, in our church, in our lives, in our country, in our area. But in that state of flux, there's one constant, and that's God. We'll do well to remember that when we sort of, I lose patience, I know, and I sort of think, oh, come on, I want this to happen, and I get itchy feet, and I want this to go that way and that to go the other. God sometimes just says, be still and know that I am God. I'd like to uh, finish with the words of another hymn. Um, this Methodist hymn book is, is wonderful for, for, words, is, uh, for words that we don't always sing. But it's kind of going back over the, um, the, the, the Old Testament stories. God it was who said to Abraham, pack your bags and travel on. God it was who said to Sarah, smile and soon you'll bear a son. Travelling folk and aged mothers, wondering when they thought they'd done. This is how we find God's people, leaving all because of one. God it was who said to Moses, save my people, part the sea. God it was who said to Miriam, sing and dance to show you're free. 
shepherds, saints, and tambourinists doing what God knew they could. This is how we find God's people liberating what they should. In this crowd which spans the ages, with these saints whom we revere, God wants us to share their purpose, starting now and starting here. So we celebrate our calling, so we raise both heart and voice as we pray that God through living may find, sorry, as we pray that God through our living more may find that they are God's choice. And the line that stuck out there is that, you know, God wants to share their purpose starting now and starting here. And that means you and me. Our final hymn, as Ian's already uh, indicated, uh, was uh, written just a couple of weeks ago in Ireland in, uh, at the Gettys, have a, a, a songwriter's workshop, and uh, two Matts, Matt Papa and Matt Boswell, uh, wrote this song that we heard at the beginning, Our God, He Goes Before Us. And I thought you might like just to hear from Matt Boswell, uh, those of you who haven't already heard this, um, how the song came about, and then we'll stand to sing it. Our God Will Go Before Us is a hymn, a new hymn, that really springs from the ground of Exodus 33, where Moses is standing at Sinai, interceding on behalf of the people, and saying, God, we're looking to go to the promised land, if we have the land of milk and honey, but we don't have the presence of God, I'd rather have your presence than all of that. And so he says, let your presence go with us. I was meeting with a church planter about 15 years ago. And normally when you meet with a church planter, they're praying for two things, people and money. <laughs> and yet I met with this guy and I said, how can I pray for you? And he said, pray that God would go with us. And I just, it just hit me like a load of bricks. And so years later when we set out to plant a church that that sort of became the prayer that i prayed god go before us go with us i don't want to have a quote successful church if your blessing and favor aren't in it and so i started praying that and i kept praying it and even it's it, i even heard one of our church members pray that a few weeks ago which was really special and so we started singing it. And so Matt and I set out to write this hymn that would, that would talk about that. It sort of is a prayer for a church. It could be sung at a commissioning service for a missionary or a church plant, or we think even works well as a benediction. The final verse says, Now send us in your presence and lead us on to heaven where songs of sorrow strain no more and our every breath is praise. And so uh, there is a sort of doxological uh, awareness of suffering in the mission that God's sent us to, but the confidence of we know who holds the future. Oh, 
special to be in Belfast a couple of weeks ago at the launch of that song nobody had sung it before um, seven and a half thousand people in Belfast arena wow did it uh, have some impact and uh, it has inspired me I make no bones about it let's just pray Lord as we enter a new week we ask you to go before us keep beside us and may we sense you behind us, guiding and supporting. Whatever we get involved in, Lord, deepen our trust in you. And may we know that you are with us. And you will lead us home in your way and in your time. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.